The first reading on this Pentecost Sunday is the account of Pentecost, recorded for us in the book of Acts, the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. This lesson is the basis for the sermon this morning. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we dig into our first reading today, and actually part of our second reading as well, let's ask for God's blessing in prayer. Come, Holy Ghost, guide divine, and cause the word of life to shine. Teach us to know our God aright, and to call him Father with delight. From every error keep us free, let none but Christ our master be, that we in living faith abide, in him our Lord, with all our might, confide. Amen. The day of Pentecost is a big day. That's why we observe, that's why we celebrate Pentecost every single year. So just like we celebrate and observe Christmas and Epiphany and Easter and Ascension, so also we celebrate Pentecost every single year. And for that reason, I would guess that our first reading from Acts today is, is fairly familiar to you because you literally read it every single year. And I would guess that most of us in here could probably recount the story of Pentecost to someone just off the cuff and not leave off too many of, of the details, the key details in the story. 
But even though we can recount the story fairly easily, that doesn't necessarily mean that we understand or grasp all the details in the story. Undoubtedly, there, there have been and there will continue to be questions that arise in our minds whenever we read the account of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. It is a fascinating story, is it not? As we pick up the story here in gospel history, uh, the disciples are all in one place, uh, just like today, on a Sunday morning. It's the 10th day after Christ's ascension, and it's the 50th day since the first Easter Sunday when Christ had risen from the dead. And as they're gathered there on that Sunday morning, something very unique, unprecedented before then and, and since then, something happened. The Holy Spirit made his presence known, and he made it known visibly. Did you notice? Because there was this sound of a violent wind blowing, but there wasn't actually any wind. And then we're told that what seemed like tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each one of them. So when you put all that together, you kind of start scratching your head, right? What does this mean? What does this look like? Because it's like the Holy Spirit's presence sounds like wind, but it's not wind. And it looks like fire, but it's not fire. And it moves like water, but it's not water. Fascinating, right? And then we're told that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. When you read that, you, you kind of wonder, well, what exactly does that mean, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit? But as you keep reading the story, you, you at least grasp at least one thing that that meant on this particular day in history. Because these disciples, these apostles, began speaking in tongues and languages they had never learned. That was one of the gifts of the Spirit on that particular day. This next part of the story is probably the one that makes the most sense to us, right? Because as the disciples are preaching in these tongues they've never learned, the people that are in Jerusalem on that festival day, as they heard their native tongue being spoken, they started assembling in that spot where they heard their tongue being spoken. And they were amazed. Like, they never expected to hear people that were from Galilee speaking in these tongues they'd never learned in their own native tongues from their places in the empire. And they're amazed and perplexed and, and wondering to themselves, what does this mean? This must be a sign from God or something. But then did you catch what some others present there that day said about the disciples and the believers? They observed this whole thing taking place and they said, oh, They've had too much wine. That's what's going on here. But that's actually what uh, Peter had to get up and address, right, in the first part of his speech, because he had to get up and say, no, listen to me, guys. That's not what's taking place here. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. No. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. The Spirit has been poured out as Joel said would happen. But again, that accusation of drunkenness is kind of an odd thing, isn't it? I guess as I've thought about this story uh, for many years, I've, I've always connected that accusation of drunkenness with this, you might say, miraculous speaking in tongues as the disciples spoke in other languages. And that was the, the reason for this accusation. But that connection's kind of puzzling, right? Because as we all know, you, you wouldn't just see someone speaking in a foreign language and think that they had drunk too much wine. In fact, the reality usually is that if you drink too much wine, it affects your ability to speak the tongue that you natively speak, right? So the more that I think about this accusation, the more that I wonder if maybe 
this accusation isn't connected to the speaking in languages, but rather it's an observation based on the disciples and the believers' apparent behavior, their general demeanor. I don't know, as you picture the disciples and, and the believers gathered on this Pentecost day, uh, don't you picture them in a happy, joyful mood? If you'd observed them, wouldn't they have probably appeared to be quite lighthearted and carefree? Don't you wonder if, if maybe people were mingling and talking there wasn't any awkwardness, and they seemed to be genuinely enjoying themselves on Pentecost Sunday. Now think about it, when you're walking downtown on, a, on an afternoon on a Thursday, say, and, and you walk by an establishment with a little outside patio, and everyone sees, seems happy and joyful and lighthearted and carefree, and they seem to be genuinely enjoying themselves, what do you think to yourself? You say, I know what's going on there. That's called happy hour. <laughs> right? Well, that seems to be what the people in Jerusalem thought about the apostles and the believers. They sized up the commotion surrounding them from a distance without listening to what they were saying. And they thought, I know what that is. That's happy hour. Someone got the party started really early this morning. But again, Peter has to get up, right? And he has to say, folks, this is not what's going on. These men are not drunk. It's not happy hour, as you suppose. No, the Spirit has been poured out, as God said the Spirit would be. But again, that leaves us with kind of an uncomfortable teaching this morning, doesn't it? I mean, are, are we supposed to be thinking that the pouring out of the Spirit looks a lot like, like happy hour? Well, in a sense, <laughs> yes. In a certain sense, that's true. And actually, I think our second reading today from, Gal from Ephesians can actually help us to understand the connection, okay? So our lesson is from Ephesians, that second reading we have there, and in the middle of that, St. Paul says some interesting things as he guides Christians in their life of, of serving Christ and in sanctified living. Uh, he says, uh, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And then he makes an interesting contrast, okay? One that probably seems a bit odd to us and really not connected. Uh, he says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. That sounds like an odd sort of connection, doesn't it? But if you're reading this in Greek, it'd make a little more sense because you see that the word that's used for get drunk and the word that's used for be filled is the same Greek word. So what Paul is really saying is he's saying, do not be filled with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So again, it's an odd connection for us, but the Spirit himself is the one making this Connection. The picture is that each one of us is a vessel. We are people with a soul that has the capacity to be filled, to be filled with something, right? And so St. Paul says, do not be filled with wine. Well, why not? Because it leads to debauchery. You see, drinking wine to excess, it numbs your conscience and it shackles your new person of faith and it gives your sinful nature 
control. And so when you've drunk too much wine, you begin to say things, evil things, that you wouldn't otherwise say. You begin to do things, evil things, that you shouldn't do. And regret and guilt and who knows what else is waiting for you when you sober up. That's why St. Paul says, do not walk down that path. Do not be filled with wine. It leads to debauchery, to bad things. Then he says, instead, be filled with something else. Be filled with the Spirit. Think about it. Just like wine numbs your conscience and shackles your new person and gives your sinful nature control, so the Spirit enlightens your conscience, shackles your old person of sin, and gives your new person of faith control. That's the connection. Because when you're filled with the Spirit, you say things, good things, that you wouldn't otherwise say. And you do good things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And in that way, God is glorified. And you're emboldened to live in a way that you wouldn't otherwise live, but it's a good thing. I think St. Peter actually is a great example of how this is true. Because think about St. Peter, right? Just 53 days earlier, he was way too timid to even tell a slave girl in the high priest's courtyard that he even knew Jesus. He denied it with an oath three times. I do not know the man. No connection to him at all. Scared of telling a slave girl he belonged to Jesus' group of disciples. And yet here he is on Pentecost Sunday. 53 days later, he gets up and tells everyone there, thousands of people, that he's a disciple of Christ. And he also convicts them of actually calling for Jesus' death. And he proclaims repentance and faith in the name of Jesus Christ, whom they had crucified. What accounts for the difference? He wasn't filled with liquid confidence. <laughs> he was filled with the Spirit. That's the difference. So, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you aren't deadened to reality, which is actually what drunkenness does. No, you've actually entered in a deeper way into God's reality. You're more aware of what God has done for you in Christ. And you feel a buzz because you know that your sins are forgiven. You have a light heart and a carefree soul because you know Christ and you know that he knows you. There's a spring in your step because you know that you have a Father in heaven who is watching out for you and looking out for you. You have this happiness and joy that transcends understanding because you're filled with the Holy Spirit. People might even wonder, as they see you in this mood, they might even wonder, like, what's that person on? And the answer is, the Spirit. <laughs> but it's, it's not always that way for us, is it? We are not always lighthearted and carefree. We're not always buzzed with forgiveness. We're not always overjoyed at the thought of, of God in heaven watching out for us and looking over us. Because the meat grinder of life this daily living and daily toils and daily struggles can very easily quench the Spirit's fire. 
And I would admit to you that I have the same issue. At least in our house these past few weeks, we've been going through a bit of a, of a car nightmare. And I must admit, I have not been overly joyful or overly happy. And if you don't believe me, ask the one back there. <laughs> it happens, right? The grind of life can quench the Spirit's fire. And so it's been a bit of an admonishment for me, an admonition for me to have to preach on being filled with the Spirit, to be totally honest. But you know, there's a, there's a neat story uh, from the life of Luther that, that touches on this whole topic. As you know, Martin Luther, the great reformer of the church, he was a man who was very much filled with the Holy Spirit and God accomplished very much through him. But the devil worked on him like he works on us and he went through periods of, of time where he was very depressed or despondent about this or that thing. And the story goes that, that things got so bad at one point that, that his wife, Katie Luther, uh, she dressed in a black gown like the black gown that she would wear to funerals. So when Luther saw her in this black gown, uh, he said, who died? And she said, God. And as Luther's puzzling over, like, what is she talking about? She said, oh, um, I figured that God must have died for you to be so despondent all the time. <laughs> and Luther got the point. And it was helpful to get him out of his period of despondency because, of course, God had not died. What mattered really was still true. And the Lord used Katie Luther to help Luther to realize that that's still true. So I hope that Pentecost Sunday does for you uh, what Katie Luther did for her husband, Martin Luther. I don't know all of what you're going through right now in your life, what troubles are troubling you, what burdens are burdening you, what frustrations are frustrating you, what hardships you're enduring. I don't know all of that. And I'm not trying to minimize any of those things because they certainly are undoubtedly heavy and weighty and burdensome. But I do want to point you to what we have in Christ as people of God in whom the Holy Spirit has worked. I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> we are truly set. That's the best way to say it. We are truly set because we are known and loved by the one true God. And he sent his son Jesus to die for all of our sins. We know Christ. And he knows us. We have a Father in heaven who watches over us and looks after us. And he's looking over us in every manner as we walk this road to heaven. And when we get to heaven, we will have the life that we've always yearned for. A life with no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain, no negative anything. And it'll be ours forever in Christ. We're set. And at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. We have the things we truly need in Christ. And so, as we live our life in this world, let there be a buzz in us because we know we're forgiven. Let there be a lighthearted and carefree way about us because we know Christ, and he knows us. Let there be a spring in our step, because we know we have a Father in heaven who's watching out for us and looking after us. Yes, in a word, let's be filled. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Rejoicing in what we have in Christ. To the point where someone might say, what is that person on? And the only accurate answer is the Spirit. Let's pray.
Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us on this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.